I welcome you. My name is Don Vibrat, and it, this is It's Your Estate Week 6, I believe. <laughs> Time passes when we're having fun. Uh, we're going to do charitable giving, which I will actually be doing rather than just being the host this time. So our, uh, we're going to start off that Pete's going to introduce Sydney, and in the background, you can see Laguna Canyon Foundation's website. So Pete, go. Oh, I love this video. Uh, hi, Sydney. Hi, Pete. Good morning. Uh, Sydney is with the Laguna Canyon Foundation. Sydney, talk a little bit about what the mission of Laguna Canyon Foundation is while we're looking at the beautiful Laguna Beach open space. Sure, absolutely. Um, so like Pete said, my name is Sydney and I've been with the foundation for about the last five years. Um, and I've been so fortunate just to get to know the organization and the history. And it started in um, 1990 with the single goal of protecting about a couple thousand acres um, between Laguna Beach and Irvine um, to purchase parcels that the Irvine company had slated for development. And what started as, you know, just kind of a small goal of a couple thousand acres and closing up shop and calling it a day it turned into a community wide environmental movement that's led to what we now call the South Coast Wilderness, um, which comprises about 22,000 acres, which is just incredible that we have this um, really valuable open space between you know, in our very, very developed Orange County in between San Diego and LA. Um, so we're really fortunate to have this incredible habitat. This habitat is um, the last of its kind. Um, it's found nowhere else in the world. We're actually part of a region called the California Floristic Region, which is designated as a biodiversity hotspot. There are only 36 biodiversity hotspots in the world. Um, so when you really just kind of step back and understand just how incredible these plants and animals are that live in our backyard, um, it's just um, so inspiring to know that these people came together, this organization came together, you know, 30 years ago to make this happen. Um, about 10 years ago, Laguna Canyon Foundation expanded its mission to not only preserving and protecting land, but also to restoring and enhancing. And um, Don, thank you so much for kind of going through our website here. You can see that we have different programs to um, carry out these missions. And um, namely land acquisition, but our biggest program right now is restoration. And that's where we go out and we actually restore the habitat. Um, a lot of our habitat is um, not very healthy um, and that's due to a multitude of causes, of course. But we go out there, we take out the um, invasive plants, restore them with native plants um, and make sure that habitat is performing at an optimum level for our um, plants and animals out there. Um, and this also lends itself to our trail program, which is more important than ever. During the pandemic, our trails saw twice the, or twice the amount of use um, that they had seen previously. What and is that, Sydney? What is, how many people use the open space? So um, while we don't have exact, exact numbers, um, estimates are between these two parks, Laguna Coast Wilderness Park and Aliso and Wood Wilderness Park, Canyons Wilderness Park. We estimate about a million users um, every year. Wow. Which, is nuts because it was about 500,000 about two years ago. So it's, um, it's quite a bit. So the other thing too about open spaces is that we have walkers, we have wild animals, mm -hmm. we have horses, we have bikers. Right. How, and everybody uses the, the same space Yes, everybody uses the same trail systems. And these trail systems, were, they're, they're a pretty primitive trail system. They weren't necessarily built to withstand this type of use. So um, especially now with all those wheels and feet, um, we have to be out there more than ever. And we do this through funding. And then we also ask volunteers to come out um, and help us. So we, we offer a ton of different opportunities for the public to come out and volunteer for a day, whether that's on the trails, helping us actually restore the trails and, um, reseed trampled habitat or close unauthorized trails, which leads to habitat fragmentation. Um, but we also, um, we also get out there and, and really try to get the community involved. Um, we're a big believer in people will protect what they love and they're not gonna love something they don't know. So making wilderness accessible for everybody is really integral to our mission. So you have some educational programs to teach? Absolutely, yeah. So we have a um, we, we offer free guided hikes for people. So if you wanna get out there and do a, a geology hike, a yoga hike, a bird walk, um, we, we offer all of those things. And um, they're all free. You can go onto our website under events um, and sign up. 
Right now, um, it's pretty limited, but we're, we're starting our programs back up again after a long hibernation due to COVID. Um, but as you can see, they're starting to get back up there and um, you can go sign up and it's a really great way to get involved. With how the many, well, approximately, what's the, how many volunteers do you have working? So, um, we have, we have two kind of two groups of volunteers. We offer these single day um, kind of non-commitment volunteer days where somebody can come out and just volunteer, plant something or work on a trail. But we also have long-term volunteers that go through, you know, an eight hour certification course in CPR. Um, and before COVID, we had about 150 of those long-term volunteers. Um, COVID, um, you know, rightly so, a lot of people held back. So right now we're we're kind of reintegrating them back into the fold, recertifying everybody, but I think we're operating around 70 right now. Yeah. And a lot of those long-term volunteers have pretty big responsibilities within the park. They do backcountry mm -hmm. patrol, butterfly point count surveys. They run our uh, wildlife video camera program. They do a lot for us. You know, one of the things that I love about the Laguna Canyon Foundation is, is that it's um, uh, anybody who cares about the environment and nature uh, can can participate locally. They can think globally, but participate locally because everything, the first part of your talk, Sydney, that you talked about is, is that we, this, this place is really special. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's unique in the world. And not only that, but we have people from all over the world coming here. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's when you donate or when you participate with the Laguna Canyon Foundation, you're really participating uh, in the world. I, yeah. it, I think it's just awesome. Besides the fact I love driving in and seeing, it's kind of like a, a stress relief that you don't see any more uh, concrete or uh, uh, that you actually see hills. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. It's such a juxtaposition between all the development that we have uh, and, and you're able to see that. And just like you said, Pete, you know, this is people who are interested in environmental worldwide. They have an opportunity to make a difference right in their own community and they get to enjoy it. Yeah. If anyone wants a tour with Sydney or uh, with any of staff person, they'd love to take you up there because it's mm -hmm. uh, it, you can't believe once you're up there how you're in the wilderness. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, I'd yeah. be happy to talk with anybody um, and please feel free to reach out to Pete or Don. Um, they're huge supporters of Laguna Canyon Foundation and can connect you with anybody in our, in our, on our team. And we'd love okay. to chat. How can they get a hold of you, Sydney? Sydney, how Thank can they get a hold of you? Oh, um, well, you can email me um, at my name, sydney at lagunacanyon.org. Um, if you don't remember, I'm horrible with names. So if you're like me, um, you can always just do giving at lagunacanyon.org that might be easier to remember um and then if if that doesn't or work, just go to the website go to the website yeah give us a call we have our phone number i think there's a um there's a contact us down there as well okay um, and, and we'd be happy to hear yeah. from you or don or pete can yeah. forward your email on and a shout out and a thank you if uh any other volunteers are watching this because yes it's awesome we amazing yeah couldn't do it without the volunteers Thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Thank Sydney. Thank you, guys. Love you. Are we? <laughs> yes, love, love you it. too. I love what you guys are doing. <laughs> <laughs> and we love you too, Sydney. I love you guys too. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs> okay, today we're going to do uh, 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 philanthropic planning, charitable giving. Uh, but let's go to the website so you can see some of the material that's that's there, and then Don will pull up um, uh, his ask first form. Um, these are the articles that we have on the website. And of course, the presentation is on there as well. And it's basically how to make the most out of year end giving. That's an up to date article. Uh, it's real estate gifts are, are right now because of the market is so high, give you a lot of leverage as far as some of the gifts that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we honestly believe, and it's part of our mission in financial and estate literacy, that giving is just good for you. Um, let's go to the uh, your ask first form, Don, so we can introduce you. Uh, yes, just a moment. 
<laughs> Let me stop sharing this so that I can get rid of this guy over here. And that's not what I want. I want this guy. There you go. Okay. So now I'll go share that one. Sorry about that. Technical issue. Um, so I want this one and we'll go back. Okay. Okay. Uh, you got a master's or other advanced degree. What is I that? Do. I have a master's in business administration. Um, I have a bachelor's degree from, well, both are from the University of Southern California. Uh, I, my undergraduate degree was accounting and statistics. And so being the data nerd that I am, I wound up going to work for a large accounting firm in their consulting department, but went through, did the CPA exam, all those things, and have been <laughs> certifiable. I don't know. <laughs> that always sounds so strange to me. I've uh, been a CPA for 30 years and maintained my license the entire time through. Uh, but I do not do audits. I don't do people's taxes. I don't do any of that. I'm a numbers guy and, and work with those. So, And, and uh, it shows that uh, under relevant licenses, which um, I'm probably a philanthropic advisor or a certified gift planning associate is not really a license. It's right. more of a credential. I wish you would move that up to the credential area. There's only uh, one lineup <laughs> under credentials. You can expand uh, <laughs> it. But anyway, what does that mean? What did you do to get that? So what happened was um, you know, years ago, I don't know, last, oh, still in this century. I, I get Pete later on for a last century thing. Um, Pete and I were chatting one day and, and my wife and I owned a building. And we decided to sell it. And I went, yeah, we're going to pay horrible, horrible taxes in this thing. And Pete said, why don't you do a charitable gift annuity? And I said, I'm sorry, a charitable remainder trust, wrong one. Uh, we were talking about the other a minute ago. And so I decided, being the data nerd that I am, to research it. And there's a, a company called Crescendo Software, which is listed in here. And so in going through that, I went through all of their courses and did all the other things on how to look at various charitable giving methodologies. And at which point Pete then said, why didn't I become the philanthropic advisor to finance and estate literacy, which is that one. And again, I am a associate within planning many, associate degree. How many hours did you put in to uh, uh, approximately? A uh, uh, hundred. Hours. Yeah. Yeah, this is There's not this whole just series a, of courses and then yeah, exams yeah. and all kinds of other yeah, stuff. This is not like, just pay your money and all of a sudden you get certified. No, in fact, it so didn't cost down, anything. <laughs> let's go down. Uh, 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 I, there you go. Um, how do you charge clients? First of all, I've never charged anybody. Um, <laughs> so we just put down $200 for first hours free. Um, what I do is, and you'll see it at the end of the presentation, you know, if you want to talk, let's talk about it. Here's an email address. Send me, fill out the form if you want, or just let me know you want to chat and we'll do a Zoom call or do something else. And I've done all kinds of what ifs for people. And to me, that's the really the important thing is I'm not going to tell you this is what you need to do. I'm going to tell you here are options and things to think about because the decision is not mine. It's, it's the individual and where do they want to give and what do they want to support? And that to me is really the key to this. We're both very big on education and help people understand here are the options and here's what it means to you in terms of where you go. So that's what we do. And you don't sell annuities, insurance, mutual don't, funds. Don't sell a darn else. thing and have no interest in any of that stuff. So there's and no conflict of interest to me. And you'll work with any person, no matter what charities, and the charity doesn't give you any kind of remuneration. The joke I have is that I'm charity agnostic. I don't care what charity it is. I will tell you it has, I, I'm going to tell you to give in the US certainly, it needs to be a 501c3. It needs to be a valid charity. Yeah. But what that charity is, is completely up to the individual. I don't, because you can't give to a political party as a charity. So we don't even have to get into politics. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, a lot of those kinds of things, no, I, I get nothing from the charity. Uh, and that's what the way it should be. And by because, the way, it, in philanthropy, Anyone who receives any type of remuneration or commission is considered unethical right. in fundraising. Right. Right. So be careful out there. And let's get into the program. We'll go for the basics all the way to a bit more complex. There you go. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about today is basically a secret your, your advisors are never gonna tell you either because they don't know or they have no reason to tell you. It, to me, it's very important. I think charitable giving is a good thing, but I have no problem if someone gets something back from that. So they should make it be a tax advised, tax secure, although 
taxes shouldn't wag the dog. It should be, this is what I want to do. And oh, incidentally, you get something back. Because to me, what part of what we're really looking at here is the issue of your life, your heirs, or who you want to give them anything to. And hopefully at this intersection, there's also something for charitable giving. And if there isn't, there's nothing wrong with that. It's still a matter of what individual choices you have. So to me, really what charitable giving means is a lot of things. It isn't, oh, we got to give some big amount of money. If you give $10 a week to your church, that's a wonderful thing. But let's talk about how to do that and how to make that into a charitable gift, which might save you a fair amount of money when you, we really start talking about this. So it's not really just giving, it's you're also getting something back if that's available to you. Again, it shouldn't be the reason why you give, but it's not a bad reason that you can wind up with. And so how do you put these two together? What are the plans giving? What's the return? What do you want for yourself? And in reality, your beneficiaries, because a lot of these things will carry over into future generations. It, it really is part of a, an overall financial and estate plan. I mean, it's certainly when, when Gene and I looked at it in terms of giving this building away, first thought is, oh my God, you know, my children are going to kill me if I do this. The other part of it was it became a heavy part of our, our financial plan and then estate plan when we both pass away in terms of where this goes. And so that's really, I think, important to look at it beyond just, I want to give money to the church or to whoever, a hospital or something. It's important to me, at least for you, to, for people to understand what, what charitable giving and what deductions one gets. So part of this is income tax deduction. If you give money to charity today and looking at the rules today under the CARES Act, if you want to give X amount of money to someplace and you give them cash and you get nothing back other than a very nice thank you note from them, then you can deduct that whole thing from your taxes. Okay. If, however, you can get an income tax deduction, if you give something, a charitable gift annuity, as an example, you give a university or you give a hospital or someone else who's going to do a charitable gift annuity with you, you'll get a tax deduction, but not for the whole thing, because you're going to get money back. So yes, there's a deduction, but yes, you get a return from that. So you get the net value of that. And in 2021, you can give away up to $100,000 in Actually, it's your entire, now it's changed, ironically. It's up to your total adjusted gross income. You could give away to charity. And if that's cash, you could take 100% of that off. You can do what, what this is saying as a qualified charitable gift annuity. You could take your required minimum distribution, and we will talk more about this in a minute, and you can give that to charity. And that's 100% deductible because it doesn't come into your income. I'm sorry, Pete, there was a question from you. Nope. Or you were just licking your lips for what excitement this is going to be. <laughs> no. Nope. The other nope. side of the deductions are estate tax deductions. When you die, you have an estate. And for most people, virtually all of us that I know, and certainly us, you know, each person right now gets $11.7 million as a deduction. So as a married couple, you have 23,000, $23,400,000. And you pay no estate tax. If you're higher than that, congratulations. I thought Bill Gates was one of your friends. Uh, never met the man, never know the man, but yes, I use Microsoft products, but that's okay. Uh, that becomes an estate tax deduction if it happens after your death. The same thing, if you give cash away, that would reduce dollar for dollar. If you give it, but your beneficiaries are going to get some money out of it, then the net effect, net amount would in fact be the deduction. So for most of us watching this little bit of presentation of years, the QCD, which we're going to talk about more, as right I now. understand it. Okay. Right now, yep. That's the that's that's one we all need to know. Uh, yes. So individual retirement accounts. And next week, you're going to talk more about retirement accounts. So I'm not going to go into a lot of depth in it. For your IRA, your 401k, your 403b, yiddy, 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 all these happy little things, you put money generally into these, not a Roth account or not some other account. You put money in that you paid no tax on. It was pre-tax dollars. So when it comes out, the IRS wants their portion. So they're going to tax through a required, they're going to get the part of that money through a required minimum distribution. That used to be 70 and a half or older. It was changed during COVID and all the rules that were in there to 72. So Sunday is my birthday and I turned 72. And therefore I will have to take an RMD this year. You mean I am older than you, Don? You have been older than me the entire time we've known each other, Pete, and by a long stretch. I don't know how many months, but a long time. Anyway, 
<clears throat> so this year I will have to take an RMP. When that money comes out, it's taxable as normal income. Oh, wait a minute, it's my retirement money. This is sort of like social security, which gets taxed also. It comes out as ordinary income to you. That raises your income tax. But what it may also do, and what chatting with a lot of people, it raises, it may raise your Medicare bill because you crossed a threshold. So now you're doubling down. I have to take the RMD or tripling down. You have to take the RMD, whether you want it or not. And most people want it because they need the money. It's going to raise my income tax and I'm going to have to pay more in for Medicare. What's my alternative? There's this thing called a QCD, a Qualified Charitable Distribution. This is for an IRA. It is not for a 401k or 403b. It's for an IRA account. So if you take your money out from an RMD, are you going to, and you are older than 70 and a half, not 72, when our government is very efficient at how they run things. I'm sorry, that was a somewhat cynical statement because when they raised the age for RMD to 72, they forgot to move the age for qualified charitable distribution. So it happens to be at a younger age, that's okay. You can take as much of that money out of your RMD, as much as you want, or as little as you want, up to $100,000. Okay, that would mean you'd have to have about a $3 million RMA, I mean, IRA account and be about my age, and I don't have that. So as an example, I, I need to take out $22,000 out of my account this year. I can take part of that and give it to charity. If I give it to charity, it's reduced from my income. So it doesn't matter if you're on standard deduction. And so this applies for almost anything. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples in a minute. Whatever you're giving to charity, you're giving money to your church, you're giving, you know, wanna give something to Laguna Canyon Foundation or whoever it is, you can do this through a qualified charitable distribution. And what you do as an example, so let's say my RMB was 25,000. If I said to whoever my broker is, so Merrill Lynch, Schwab, whoever has the account, I want you to write a check to Laguna Canyon Foundation, St. Joe's Hospital, my church, whatever it happens to be, for X amount of money. And let's say in this case, I want to give away $15,000. I can have as many checks as I want. It isn't one charity, it's whoever you want. They write the check. And what most people do is they say, and mail it to the charity. I'm going to suggest you don't do that. I'm going to suggest that they write the check to the charity and mail it to you. You get it, you make a photocopy of it, so you have it for your records. You address the envelope to the charity and include a note, because if the check comes straight from the brokerage firm, they have no clue who just sent them the money. Well, if I've told them I'm gonna give them money, I'd like to know that they've got the money. Therefore, here's what you do. Now, if I was in a 20% tax bracket, I'd just save $3,000, which is nice. And it, what was the effort? I just had to tell them to do it. Will your broker tell you about this? No. General rule, they don't. Why not? Well, it's easier to write one check to me than several checks to charities and the rest to me. That's a little harder for them. So let's make it easy and not do that. That's a shame. So as an example, if you gave $50 a week to your church, as an example, that's $2,600 a year. For you to pay out $2,600 to your church, you had to take out $3,250 out of your IRA because it's gonna cost you $650 in taxes. You save that money by saying to them, write the check for me. And you could tell them, I mean, people take out their, out of their RMD, they may take it out monthly because they need the money. You could tell them, pay them three times a year, pay them only in June, pay them in December, whatever you want. Give them the money and you just save that much money in taxes. Bottom line is, if you're 70 and a half and you want to donate to charity and you have an IRA, take the money out of the IRA. It'll, it'll, <clears throat> it'll save you money and allow you even if you want to give more, you can. And it doesn't matter for the amounts. And incidentally, you cannot put it in your, in your private foundation if you have one of those, yeah. or you can't put it in a donor advised fund. It yeah. has to be directly to an operating charity. The other part of the, what you wind up with your IRA is the fact that when you give money, put money into your IRA and you pass away, it used to be that your heirs, your kids, whoever it happened to be, and exclude wives, spouses. Spouses are 
they just carry on forward and it doesn't, unless you say not to give it to them, um, they carry on as you did. It doesn't matter their age, they're, they're exempt from this. If whoever you wanna give the money to is more than six years older than, younger than you, then they have to take out the money within 10 years. So they could take it all out on day one, all out on the end of 10 years or whatever they want in between, but it has to be gone in 10 years. Now, remember when they take it out, it's gonna be taxable as ordinary income to them. But it also means you have no control over your, I, I refer to them as creative children. Your kid who really wants, who has a, the Ferrari dealer on speed dial waiting for you to die so they can take your, uh, your IRA money and go buy something big. Um, it, but it's limited to this 10 years. An option is you set up a testamentary trust. You put the IRA into it when you pass away and have the money come out at either a specific amount, a specific number of years. It's not limited to 10 years, so you can set it up for 15, 20 years, and they take the money out. It grows tax-free while they're doing this. They can't take it out faster. So if you want to limit what they're getting or extend the time, then you can do a, a testamentary trust with the IRA. Does a, Don, does a QCD apply to an inherited IRA as well, uh, not just a regular IRA? IRA? I do not know the answer. The answer is yes. It I, I was going to say, my, my assumption would be yes, because you've taken over the rights and privileges. Exactly. But it still has to be an IRA. It has to be an IRA. Right. And yeah. is uh, the other question is, is a donor advice fund the best way to give to charities and help your own tax situation? If I'm not yet 70 and a half years old and that cannot use a QCD. I think we probably are going to talk a little bit about donor advice funds later mm -hmm. on. So let's hold off to answer that question a little bit later. My we'll quick answer to that, that. but my, my quick answer would be, if you have a highly appreciated asset, give it to charity. If you're younger, then you could just give it to them outright and you'll get a tax deduction for the, for the value of it. However, you can't put that into a donor advised fund and there's some restrictions there. We'll come back to that one in a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So testamentary trust, how would this thing work? Well, as an example, if you said, I have an IRA of $500,000, just a number, and I have a creative kid who happens to be 45 years old. If you put that, first of all, when you put the 500,000 in, the, tr the estate will get $107,000 tax deduction. That probably isn't relevant because the 11 million seven. Are you are you talking this? Uh, I'm a little bit confused, Don. Uh, I'm sorry. Are, are you doing a testamentary unit trust from an estate plan or from an IRA account? I am taking my IRA account and I am okay. funding a testamentary unit trust. Okay. So I take my IRA and I give it to this to a trust, which is going to take effect when I pass away. Okay. We're talking now about a charitable remainder trust. Is that correct? Yes. And what does uni mean? Uh, Charitable remainder uni trust is a fixed percentage. We're going to come to that in a few minutes. Okay. So let me come back to that one. The important part here is you might say, my God, my kids are going to kill me if I do this because what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is over their lifetimes, that 500,000, they're going to take out a million seven. How is that possible? How is that possible? Pete would ask. Well, that's possible because they expect that your kid's going to live a really long time. And the way this was set up, you're only taking out 5%, but the trust is earning more. So it's actually growing over time. So it's it, we keep always saying it's the Warren Buffett thing, compounding interest. You leave the money in and it keeps growing. Well, they're taking out a fixed amount. So they're limited to how much they can take out. And in the beginning, that's going to be $25,000 because it put in 500,000. But over time, they value it each year. As it grows, they actually get more money year over year as that goes forward. So you're, you're assuming that the investments within the trust will grow at an approximately 7% per year. And so when I set this up as an example, I said, yes, 7%. And the reason it says 6.87 is because you get paid quarterly. So it reduces down the overall amount. But yes, okay. and we'll come but back you, to all of those. Okay, but that's fairly conservative. That, well, <laughs> Pete and I have a friend who, uh, I don't know, 20 some years ago, set up a charitable remainder trust he takes out 8% a year, has since the beginning. He opened it up with a million dollars. It is currently worth a million dollars. <laughs> and he's been taking out 8% a year, plus investment fees, plus management fees, 
and it's still worth what it was when he started. And it doesn't mean, and we'll, yes, Pete, we'll go back to the one recently we closed okay. um, to talk about how those things work. The other thing is a bequest. When you pass away, the largest form of charitable giving is actually through be bequest at death, either through a trust or through a will, you say, this is how much money I want to give to the charities. It's paid directly by the estate to whatever that charity is. And it is paid first before everybody else gets money. It's an outright gift, or it can be, as we just saw on the, on the testamentary IRA count we were looking at, they can, you can get benefits for people in the future. And we'll come to the one that Pete loves to talk about in, the, in a minute. We would recommend that if you're doing this, you give a percentage. I'm going to use my sister as an example. I pick on my older sister at times for various reasons, but she wants me to be the executor of her estate someday. So she has in there originally give X amount of money to these two charities. And I said, no, change it to a percentage because if your estate goes up or your estate goes down, that locked dollar amount could be a problem. If your estate really crashed, then nobody else gets anything because that's how much you want to give to charity, which she did. And that's fine. Um, and because her estate's growing, they'll get more money. And that's fine. She can change it while she's alive to anything she wants it to be. There's no income tax because it's after your death. It would affect your estate tax, not your income tax. Yeah. So a bequest is the most common way for most individuals to give to charity upon their death. Mm -hmm. And it's also the simplest because mm -hmm. it just requires the naming of the charity right. and their address. Right, and that could be your IRA, or I, and in fact, beneficiary designation is in a way similar to that. Yeah, but a couple of things about that. Please. One is, do you want it locally, or do you want to give to the national organization? State that in uh, when you do the bequest. Um, Don has all, already mentioned that percentage is this, the best way because 5% of a million, 5% of 10 million, it's going to be 5% uh, versus a specific amount. Third is attorneys don't like to do this, but I think it's really important and put a couple of lines in there about why you are doing it. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I'm going to be giving to PBS and NPR. Why? Because I like news without the corporate commercials, uh, or at least I mean, the minimum of commercials. So that's important to me because that's what we do here in financial and estate literacy. We do not allow any for-profit company to be a sponsor. So it passes on what I'm trying to say is if you state the reason why you pass on that value to your children as to why you're doing this, what's right. important to you. And the charity allows you to do that. Whatever passion, whatever belief you have, giving some monies to them allows your family members to know what is important to you. Beneficiary designations, Don. So within your IRAs or savings accounts, or other kinds of things, you can set up the fact that when I pass away, this is where the money is going to go. Again, on a pre-tax account, it's going to be taxable to the individuals. If you give it to a charity, it is not. So you can designate this on life insurance policy, whatever it happens to be, you can designate these. I want to make sure that there's a clear understanding. When you do a beneficiary designation, it overrides a will or a trust. It's completely separate. Make sure that you keep these up to date. If someone passed away and they were a beneficiary on an account you have, change it. If you Ooh. divorced, change it. My, I, I use as an example, my son-in-law, his uh, mother was living with a gentleman for a large number of years and they never, they never married. He was very ill, had taken a life insurance policy, all these other things. And oh, incidentally, he never got divorced from his wife. That's interesting because when he passes, his wife is the beneficiary. By intestate law in California, if he doesn't have a will or trust or anything else. And so it became a matter of, oops, who did he really want the money to go to? Now he had made 
the beneficiary designation on the insurance policy was my son-in-law's mom. Um, okay, well, that was different, but there was this real oops kind of a moment yeah. of, did, did this happen? So yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a beneficiary designation we're going to talk more on in, yeah. Um, yeah. in uh, the retirement planning. But one of the questions is, can a bequest be set up through a brokerage house instead of listing beneficiaries? Or is that the same thing if the money goes to a 501c3? I believe what she's asking is, where do you get the beneficiary designation forms? From the firms. From the firm. So yeah. you get them from the brokerage house. Right. Ask them for a copy of it. And we'll talk more about that in the retirement planning yeah. session. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and the next question is, does a beneficiary designation or a TOD or a POD, which basically means paid on death, do they override a will or a trust? And the, yes. answer, the answer of that is yes. And yes. that's, again, why we're going to get into that next week on right. retirement planning. Right. Yep. Yep. Let's go to the next slide. Charitable gift annuity. So when... When, if you're on the it's your money side of, of these seminars, webinars, however, if they're in person or we're doing it in Zoom, they always say, oh, be very cautious of, of annuities. And I'm always very quick if I'm involved with them to say commercial annuities, a charitable gift annuity, nonprofits use this across the country, larger ones who are set up to manage them. And they all use the same amount, the same rate. And it's set by the American Council on Gift Annuities. And virtually every nonprofit uses the same rate. There's a couple that don't because they think they can market and get more money. Uh, and that's their choice. But the vast majority of them will use this set rate. And it is based on your age and whether you're single or dual life to the two of you. The important thing is when you sign these, as with an annuity, it's locked in the amount. So it is not good for inflation, but they are unusual in that a charitable gift annuity, if you, and I, I always use, David Moore at Chapman University because David's wonderful and they do great things and I'm not promoting Chapman in any way and I don't have an incentive to do so. I just will use them as an example. If you went to David and said, I want to do a charitable gift annuity, David would say, oh, happy to do that. You know, what's your age? Here's the rate, everything else. And here's a two page form that we want you to read that you will need to sign. Two pages, not a book, not eight to 12 pages, a very, very fine print. And David's going to say, read it, whatever you want to talk, you know, let me know. We'll be happy to go through this with you because there's no financial incentive. David, yes, would like to have you sign up, but he doesn't get a commission when this is done. There is no, if you give them $100,000, $100,000 is going to be invested. If you do this with a normal commercial annuity, you know, 100,000, you might get 80,000 that actually gets invested or less. Um, so this is a straight pass through to them. The charity is required to set aside funds. The uh, uh, insurance commissioner, for instance, the state of California, oversees that this money is, in fact, invested and that it is, in fact, protected. I joke with David that, well, if I did a charitable gift annuity, can I have my name on a classroom door? Yeah, no, that doesn't work. But they have to set aside funds to, be, to make sure that this is, in fact, there. I can't use the word guarantee because there's lots of legal, legal things. It's virtually assured you're going to get your money out of this thing and it's going to pay through the entire time. The, 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 the charity would have to literally be totally broke yes. uh, in order to have absolutely no assets. The gift right. annuitants come before anyone uh, if a charity is, is, is going bankrupt. Uh, I, I, I don't know of any charity in California that has not paid their gift annuitants. In fact, most of the gift annuitants live longer than the regular yeah. population. Yeah. That, that's a joke is that if you, <laughs> if you give money to a charitable gift annuity, we extend your life. <laughs> they're based on assumptions as to when you're going to pass. And a lot of them have overrun yeah. it. And there were back in the past when interest rates were higher, there were some really high interest rates on charitable gift annuities that they're but, still living with because it goes for the rest of your but, life. But look at, uh, Don, look at the, uh, at 90, where can you get a guaranteed 8.6% return? For the rest of however your long your life is yeah. going to be for one or two of you, incidentally, in terms of where that goes through. An important characteristic of this is you don't have to start it on day one. 
So you'd mentioned a little bit in terms of planning or longer. If you said this is an, a retirement planning item you may have, you could defer its start. You could defer this and have this be testamentary. Set this up for your, for your beneficiaries and have it pay through their lives or periods of time. Um, so that's part of what you go through. One of the important things that we use as an example is if you have non-income producing stock, um, but you need cash, right now you have to sell that stock to do it. Well, if you gave that to a charity, then you pick up these kinds of interest rates that are coming out of it. So we love Berkshire Hathaway stock. It's this lovely thing and it pays no dividend. But if you gave it to a nonprofit, they pay no tax because they're a nonprofit and you get the insurance. So let me show you an example of this. So if you gave my infamous $500,000 you gave, now at this point you're alive. So you gave 500,000. You're going to get a tax deduction of $208,000 that you're going to be able to take off of your income tax, which will save you money. In this example, I said 81, 87, pay for both lives. They're gonna get 5.4% for the rest of their lives. The estimate is that they will take back over their lifetimes, they'll pay, get back $410,000 and they're actually gonna earn 7.44. So when Pete said, look at how much it is for 90, this is what you get. You actually get back more effectively because part of the income you get back is return on capital, maybe capital gains, and a part of it is ordinary income, which means you actually earn more money by doing this. And this is based on dual lives. And so that number may be different from what you looked at. So a charitable gift annuity is very simple, a very simple form. They are irrevocable. So once you sign it, it's, it's live. But on the other hand, very simple, very easy to understand what it looks like and what's going on. A charitable remainder trust, which we're going to get into in a minute, are very flexible and much more complicated and expensive to do, but are a wonderful tool in terms of going through. So Before, people use charitable gift annuities for the uh, possibility of, hey, I want some fixed income yes. for the rest of my life. Yes. And I want to be assured that's kind of part of my social security or pension plan. Yes. Um, uh, uh, part of my total financial plan as far as that is concerned. Right. The other thing is, is, is that uh, people give charitable gift annuities to other people. Yeah, yeah they don't have to be a relative. And no. you get the income tax deduction um, based on their age. So right. sometimes they're used as gifts. Right. Uh, other times they're used as part of a reverse mortgage. We're not going to go into that. But charitable gift we annuities. No, we, have, we have an example of that. Piece. Okay, great. Yeah, we're well, talk about so there, there's some really practical uh, things about a charitable gift annuity. But again, you just don't hear about charitable gift annuities from a broker, from your financial advisor, from your CPA. They're just not that familiar with them. Well, and, and to be a little glib about it, your broker doesn't like it because you're taking money out of your account and giving it to the charity. They don't manage that money anymore. So they actually have a disincentive other than caring about you yeah. to tell you that information. So that's the other. But our charitable remainder trust is more involved, but has a lot more flexibility in terms of what you can do with them. I'm going to say that, you know, looking at a charitable remainder trust or lead trust, um, either one, this probably, is, first of all, you want a, a highly appreciated asset so that you're getting an interesting tax return out of it, tax deductions out of this thing. But you probably really want, I say $500,000 to be able to put into this. Now, you know, it may be less, it, maybe it's 100,000, but it's, you need to be careful in terms of how much, these are expensive to set up, relatively speaking, but a tremendous advantage that you can get from them. So let me walk you through it. Let me give you the example in our case. So we had a building, we had made a significant gain on it, we looked at it, put the building into it, and you can put all or part of it. You don't have to put all, the whole thing in. And I'll show you an example of putting part in to offset your taxes. Um, but in looking at it in terms of where you go, you have flexibility. We could look at it and say, what percentage do we want out? How do we want to handle the certain things? And that Crescendo software that you keep seeing examples from tells you, yes, this is what you can do or can't do. And it's a national standard in terms of where you go. 
We talk about a remainder or a lead trust. A charitable remainder trust means we get the money during our lifetime. So it pays us every year based on the value of the, of the trust. When we pass away, what's left, the remainder, goes to charity. A lead trust, which is not nearly as common, and you'd have to have some real reasons to want to go there, you have to pay the charity now, and at the end, when you pass away, you're, or the time runs out, you that whatever the asset is goes to your beneficiary, but you've reduced the taxes on it in the long run. Uh, if you think of, gee, uh, I was involved in PayPal, and before I went public, I set up one of the lead trust and put the money into it. Uh, then when it, when it comes out, it has a different basis in terms of how they come out. A crut versus a crat, a charitable remainder uni trust, means that we get a fixed percentage every year for the rest of our lives. We can't vary the percent. We can value, vary some other things, but we can't vary the percentage. A crat is a variable, a fixed dollar amount is taken out every year. It's an annuity. The problem is a crat can run out of money. A, a charitable uni trust can't run out of money, but it can get smaller over time or bigger, either one. So I would suggest a, a uni trust if that's what you're going to do. Great. Just remember, a charitable trust is almost like a living trust, yeah. except that the remainder whatever is left over after your lifetime or number of years, it goes to charity. And because it goes to charity irrevocably, whatever happens in that trust is completely tax-free. Yes. And so it gives a lot of opportunities if you put an asset into that trust that's highly appreciated. Yeah, yeah. And when it comes out, part of it is, is ordinary income, part of it is return on, on capital gains because you've deferred your capital gains, part of it's return on investment. So it isn't whatever we take out that's automatically ordinary income. That is also a savings because it reduces the way the money comes out. Do you have an illustration? Yes, I think we probably do. Why don't we go into that? So I'm sorry, flexibility, let me back up. Oop, did it back up with me? There it is. Okay, lots of flexibility in terms of the number. Of, so we specified four charities. During our lifetimes, we can change those charities. We can do whatever we want with that part of it, but the money is going to go to charity. It will not go to our daughters. Uh, you can set up how you want to have certain things done. If you have a child that you want to take care of, it may be a spendthrift trust or a, you know, some trust fund for kids or something else, you can set all of those up within a charitable remainder trust. As an example, so in this case, I have my, my George and Kathy are uh, in their upper 70s. If they said we're going to put in $500,000, they're going to get currently a tax deduction of $179,000. That's going to save them a whole bunch of money. They're going to wind up over their lives, the way this is set up, at 7.5%. They're going to take out roughly $600 and some odd thousand dollars. That seven and a half is actually going to come out at 8.47 because part of its return on investment, part of its ordinary income, part of its capital gains tax, and that there's the thing called four-tier accounting that has to be done for these things as the money comes out. I don't do my own accounting for it. I do hire someone for that. In our case, I am the trustee of the trust, Gene and I are. Um, we have an investment advisor who, who puts invests the money as we go through it. The other thing you can do, you don't have to put in all the money. So you could say, in this case, it's a million dollar asset. We're going to get back um, $600,000. We're deferring that much of a gain. We're going to have a deduction for giving the money. But what I want to do is split the asset. So if I take cash out, I'm going to get charged capital gains on some of that money. So I can leave it in as much as I can. So out of that million, I can take out $300,000 in cash. And on the uni trust, I said, in this case, it earns 6%. The amount of deduction that I get will offset each other. So your net tax over time is zero. So you don't have to put it all in. We chose to. But you could say, no, I want to split this and take it out. Well, practical example. You own real estate for yes. an apartment building or a yep. house that you've been renting out. Well, you're getting to be 
65, 70 years old, and you go, gosh, I'm tired. Ten, tenants and, and toilets. Not something you want to deal with. Tenants and toilets. Uh, this is a real case here in yes. Laguna Beach. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, where an individual basically said, hey, I want to do a lot of travel. And I don't want to give over the uh, uh, sell the property because of the amount of income taxes that I'm going to have to pay. And I can't give away the property because I need the income to travel. And so what do you do? Well, one of the things he did was he said, please see how much of the percentage of the property I have to give away in order to get my taxes to zero and to give me a lump sum cash out of when the building is sold. Right. Because right. what I want is a, I, I want to avoid paying a tax. I want a lump sum of cash and I want an income that matched the previous rental income that I was receiving. And by the way, after spending about six to nine months going through the numbers and everything else, everything was accomplished that we set out to do with a charitable trust. The person traveled for, well, he's still traveling. <laughs> and, the, and the trust has grown and his income has increased every year. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> now, Pete, Pete mentioned something along the way in that, in that discussion that I want to come back to. You need to know that you should not. Why did we just turn on footnotes? Settings? Let me see if I can change something here. I don't know why we just went into footnotes, <laughs> which are now visible on the screen. Where did those come from? Hang on. We're going to try to. I don't know where captions came in. The notes sound share. Uh, the um, it's re it's it, it's repeating all the words that you're saying in caption form. Yeah. Whatever you've done. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, annotation? No, yeah. that's not it. No, it's footnotes. I don't know. I have not seen that come up. Um, reading controls, visual panels, everything else. I have no idea how that's coming up, but we'll keep going. I'll be honest in what I say because you can hear me anyway. Pete raised an interesting point, and I wanted to say, come back to that one. Over six to nine months, he analyzed this and then made a decision. This is not something you decide overnight. This is a long-term discussion of what are my options and how should we do this and where should we go with it? So it's very important that don't get the impression that this is something, wow, look at this. It's the middle of uh, October, late October. I want this for this year's taxes. Probably not, because you should think longer about this. This is a very important thing. It's an irrevocable, you, it's decision, an irrevocable trust. And it has to fit in with your goals and objectives. You have to crunch the numbers. To see this illustration that you see on the screen right now, this is a crescendo software illustration. Are you going to talk a little bit about if somebody wants this kind of illustration, what they need to do? Yes. Okay. The first, what I'm going to do is give an example that Pete and I just went through. Um, Last century, <laughs> I hate Pete, when you say that. <laughs> Pete was working with a couple uh, up at Long Beach State when he was there. I, I like saying it last century because actually it was 1996. And that was last century. So I, I keep saying that to Pete. They wanted to set up a charitable remainder trust that was for their joint lifetime. So it would continue to pay while they were both alive. And when the last of them died, it would continue for 15 more years to their beneficiaries. They took out 8% a year. The trust started with $1.3 million. Over their lives of the next 10 years, they took out somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars. 2006, it flipped over because the second died, and it became a 15-year trust for the remaining beneficiary, for the beneficiaries who were nieces and nephews of the couple. Over those 15 years, they continued to take out the 8%. And they received $1.5 million over those 15 years. When they, after the 15 years, the trust changed again and went to being 
the remainder goes to the charities. And there were four charities that received the money. Laguna Canyon Foundation happened to be one of them. They'd been the administrator. That's why Pete was involved over all these years. And so we distributed the money out to four different charities. Laguna and Canyon. what was that amount? And the amount that was taken out was $1,350,000. So their $1.3 million investment created uh, $4.8 million over the time. So I will show you my example in here of why it doesn't want to do that when I don't know. So now we've frozen. There. Okay. So a lot of people say, I can't do a charitable remainder trust because my children would kill me if I did that. Well, first of all, you're dead. Secondly, no, the example we just gave you, they got out a lot more money than you put into it. And so it's beneficial. Some people don't like that. And one suggestion is that what you do is you take out a second to die insurance policy that when you pass away, that money is paid to your heirs. And that certainly is an option. You'll just get less money over time because you're funding it. But that is certainly an option. But these can be set up, I mean, 15 years after, it was still paying after they passed away and paid off far more money than went into this. Okay. This thing is mad at me at the moment. So here's the example of 10 years. This is a theoretic, the other was an actual one. So you set this up, it's gonna go for your life and it's going to go over time. Hang on, there it is. So for the 500,000 going in, approximately almost 200,000 tax deduction today. So, so people sometimes ask, if I gave 500,000, why only a $191,000 deduction? Because, ah, I don't do it. So the, over time, the calculations say $727,000 is gonna be paid out. So you don't get the whole amount. Remember what I said in types of deductions? You get the net between what you put in, 500,000, and what you're going to earn over the period of your lifetime, or in this case, your lifetime plus 10 years. Yeah. Um, so all, that's the net present value of all that. That's what the software does all of that stuff for you. Yeah. And in other words, it's not a gimmick. It's not a free lunch. It, uh, there are rules. Uh, you don't get the full income tax deduction for 500000 because you're still going to be earning money from that gift over your lifetime. And that's why you need to run these numbers because we, we want to figure out for you, if you're interested in something like this, are you more interested in the income? Are you more interested in the income tax deduction? Is it more philanthropic in the sense I want the maximum to go to charity? So we need to figure out what kind of a gift are you giving? What is the value of that gift? Lots of things go into these things. But once you do, and they could turn out to be, there is no loser in this. No ch children don't lose. The giver doesn't lose. And certainly the charity doesn't lose. Right. The important part of looking at, and that this is part of this slide really points out why you need to spend the time to think about what all you want done. In our case, for instance, in our trust, we get a certain percentage, December 31 each year, value how much is in the trust, and we will get that, a percentage of that split over four payments in the next year or quarterly payments that we get out of it. I can't change that percent. I can change the way the trust acts, however. And that's because there's different types of remainder trust. This is part of why you may want to spend a good number of months going through it. The standard trust says, I'm putting in this, they sold the stock, pay me that. And pay me that ongoing. Okay. If I was 55 years old, I think I remember that that long ago. If I was 55 years old and I don't want any money until I'm 65 and plan to retire, I can set up a NICRUST, net income only, and I can tell my investment advisor, I only want growth stock. I don't want income producing stock. So now the amount from the trust shrinks and it all grows tax free until I'm 65, it starts to pay me. I can modify that one slightly by saying, don't pay me anything, <clears throat> but I wanna be a NIMCRUT, net income remainder trust basically, where make up the money that I would have earned for those 10 years, give it to me now. So I can have a really big payment as soon as I turn 65. 
That's allowed. It's grown tax-free, and now you got to take it out. In our case, we put in an office building. The office building was rented, but it didn't earn enough for us to take out our normal deduction. So we had what was called a flip trust. Until the building sold, we didn't get the normal payment, and then we started the payment, and on it went from there. So all of these are possibilities in terms of how you can control it. Where do you want to go? The important part to me is you get the tax deduction now. As Pete said, nobody loses in this. Charities are going to get whatever's left. And in between, during our lifetimes or our lifetimes plus years, this is what's going to come out of it, which is very comfortable from a retirement planning standpoint, from the state planning standpoint, are very important in terms of what we were looking at and where we wanted to go. So just like a regular living trust, mm -hmm. you can you can be you're the grantor. Yes, it's you know you're the one that's putting the asset in. Yes, you can be your own trustee. Yes, and you're going to be your own income beneficiary. Yes. Okay, but again, if you're <clears> going to be your own trustee, make sure you have two good professionals to assist you. One is a CPA mm -hmm. who makes sure that they can figure out the taxes because it's a little bit more complicated than a regular trust. And two is a fee-only fiduciary registered investment advisor mm -hmm. who can put together a diversified portfolio for you. Right. And you specify that. I mean, we told them, we, we told our investment advisor, you know, do you want to be conservative? Do you want to be liberal how do you want to do this thing which drives how much the value of the trust will be and therefore because the value is what gets us our money where are we going to wind up at the end of each year and now i know for the next year what's happening and in our case we've had it now for four years and taken taken out order. money each year all the way through this thing and it is larger today than it is when we started i didn't plan on that it's just fine with me because now we get more money but that's where we are as we sit here today. Now that will probably change over time and that's okay, but it has earned more money than has been taken out in terms of value. So it's an interesting characteristic in terms of where they go. Let's go to the next slide. Please, let's do that. There's a very important characteristic that people sometimes don't really think too much about. And before COVID, I was doing this live in Laguna Niguel. And at the end of it, there was this lady that came up I truly in tears of this particular slide had changed her life completely. So I'm going to use numbers, hypothetical numbers here. Don't worry about those. You have an asset that's a, that's a million dollars. Your basis was only a hundred thousand. So you have a really, you have a $900,000 capital gain. I said the capital gains rate is really 40%. It's not 20% or other things. By the time you add in 20 plus the 3.8% the, the charge. Medicare. Plus California. Medicare, plus California. I say it's 40%. And you can argue that if you want, but let's just use that as an example. So I'm going to have to pay capital gains tax of $360,000 on this thing, which means I net out of that $640,000. I want to give that to charity. So I give $640,000 to charity. I get a $224,000 tax deduction if I was a 35% tax rate. So my savings is $78,000, which is very nice. It's very comfy. At my age of 80, this is an example, not my real age, I would get 6.5% for the rest of my life, which means I get $41,660 a year for the rest of my life. That's nice. If, however, I had given the building, the whatever this is, to charity, they sold it, I would have gotten a $350,000 tax deduction, my 35%. I would have gotten $122,500 savings on my taxes, which would have saved me $44,000. I would then be getting $65,000 from the charity, which is $23,000 a year, more money Over than I would have had at the 41. That's more than 50% uptick. And I get that for the rest of my life. And the charity's thrilled because they got a million dollar asset instead of only, they got more, 360,000 more because they get the full million dollars. All we did was change the order in which we did this. So Pete's example before of, I have this rental unit. Well, I want to sell that. And then I want to give money to charity and get a return. 
ah, bad. In our case with our building, we had to put the we had to put the building into the trust before it was sold. And we were this close to not doing that. I didn't realize that in talking to Pete, he's going, uh, you gotta put the building in first. And so we had signed nothing with the realtor. He'd lined up buyers and I hadn't signed any document. We put it into the trust, took it out of our living trust and did a title transfer, putting it into our charitable remainder trust. Very easy to do. So we donated it to, our, to this remainder trust. We got the tax deduction, we got all those. But by doing that, candidly, we saved 1.2 million in capital gains, which I'm very happy having invested and having it grow tax-free. And when I get my, my tax statement every year, it says I paid out part of my capital gains, which it will do that until I hit life expectancy. That's so, how the government gets their money back over all of those years. Yeah. And these are all legitimate Pro, I mean, this is totally legitimate. This is not a scam. This is not a trick on the IRS. The no. IRS encourages us to make gifts to charity because charities play such an important role in our social fabric here in the United States, and it doesn't go through the government. So the right. government saves money by having the money go directly uh, to the charity. One of the things I want to point out look at the line that says 640,000 and a million when you pay your capital gains tax that money is the money that you now can turn around and invest yes when you do a charitable trust you pay no taxes up front right. so now you're working with a million dollars over the life of the trust that earns you money. And that's one of the reasons why the income is so much higher using a trust, a charitable trust. Right. Yeah. Like using an IRA account. It uh, it works out over a period of years. Right. Let's right. go to the next slide. So Pete had mentioned a life estate or a reverse mortgage. You have the ability, if you chose, to give your house to charity today and continue to live in it for the rest of your life. You get an immediate tax deduction. The charity will get the house when you pass away. You have to continue to pay maintenance, interest, anything, and, and taxes. You have to pay that as if you owned the house. But the charity now holds it. You get the tax advantage today based on the value. You can have that as an outright gift, which gets you a, a certainly a much higher tax deduction today. Or you can fund an annuity, a charitable gift annuity with this. And in a sense, that becomes a reverse mortgage. It could see, for the money standpoint, it isn't truly a reverse mortgage, but you have then the ability to get money from doing this. I'm going to preface, I'm going to preface, at this point, I'm going to point out and I preface, it's very important that you think clearly about this because you're giving away an asset. If you then needed money for your care, have you already given away a major asset that you would have to be able to pay for your care later on? There are ways of changing this over time. This is irrevocable, but there's ways of changing it. You can change, if I said, I just want to give you a life estate and then change it into a, a um, charitable gift annuity, you can do that. I will say to you, this is only for very large charities. I asked David Moore at Chapman, do you, will you do a charitable gift annuity on a life estate? No, because we don't have the money. That's not, we don't fund those. I asked Carl Wayne at the Heart Association, will you do it in a heartbeat? Pardon the pun, okay? Yes, they will definitely do it because they're large enough to deal with this. What does this thing look like? So if I'm going to give this house to charity, pay the 100,000 basis, building $500,000. What I'm going to get out of this is a $440,000 tax deduction for giving that $500,000 house because I get nothing back other than the right to live in my house, which is worth $60,000. So that's a significant savings today. The house, when you pass away, will go to the charity. You have to be aware that in these, if you have to go permanently into a retirement facility, care facility, this could be an issue to you in terms of doing these. So that's one variable for you to think about. The other is, Pete said, if you looked at this and said, 
well, I'm thinking of doing a reverse mortgage, but I want to give this ultimately to charity. You could say, fine, I'm going to give you the gift. In this case, it's only going to be a charitable deduction of 200000 because you're going to get an annuity for the rest of your life. So in this case, 77 years old, here's what the annuity is. If you put in that $500,000 house, they're going to get basically $25,000 a year for the rest of their life. Would that save you from having to do a reverse mortgage? So in a sense, you get the cash this way. Ultimately, it's going to go on to charity in terms of what's there. But you're getting basically $25,000 a year for the rest of your life. So those definitely, I paid to mention that in terms of looking at it. And there's the example of how those things work. We mentioned donor advised funds before. Donor advised funds are funds that you set up either with a, a community foundation or a brokerage firm. I mean, whether it's Fidelity, whether it's Schwab, Schwab somebody else, you can set these up. They're generally very low cost to have, low cost to even open them up uh, in terms of what's there, low fees, as I say. They're very good if you're going to bundle charitable giving. What bundling means is a lot of people, when they raise the standard deduction to 24,000, I think roughly, you can't, you have to give a lot of money to be able to, to make use of that as a charitable deduction, unless you group your, your giving. But you may have a charity that I don't want to give three years of money to them because then they'll blow it in year one. You put it into a donor advised and you have it then paid out by the donor advised over three years but you got the deduction when you put the money in. So that's, you can't do a QCD, will not go into here. That's not allowed, um, but it allows you to group those together. You then set up who is going to be in charge of that donor advised fund. You can set it up that through your life, through your name. And as the example, in our case, we decided that half of the remaining money that is coming out of the trust, half of it will go into a donor advised fund that our daughters will manage. They can't take out the cash for themselves. They get nothing from it, other than continuing the legacy of let's have charitable giving. They're very interested in it. They're very happy with it. They, we did ask our kids beforehand, are you okay with this? And they said, absolutely. In fact, they think the donor advised is so fascinating. They said, we wanna fund it so that it's open now. And because of profits they've made in their company, they're putting money to giving money to charity by putting it into that donor advised fund before COVID really kicked fully in. They funded it with a good amount of money and paid out most of it to charities, food banks, or others through 2021, 2020, and then into 2021. They've given most of that money back out away to charities. But when they wanted to fund it, they didn't know who to give it to yet. Um, so they used it from that standpoint. It's a great tool. Uh, Fidelity, gosh, probably has over a billion dollars in their donor advised fund. Um, uh, it's uh, They'll help you out. Orange County Community Foundation here locally mm -hmm. will help you as well. Uh, we recommend the Orange County Community Foundation over uh, the Fidelity just because they know uh, the charities in the community better than uh, a Fidelity or Schwab. Um, the, the wonderful thing is, and I think Don kind of alluded to it, is, is, is that it's just a wonderful tool to get your kids and grandkids involved with understanding money. Because if they're in charge of giving it away, they have to figure out who they're giving it to. And they have to talk to a lot of good people uh, uh, to do that. And it gives not just the financial wherewithal, but it gives them a lot of influence in the community as well, because they are going to support the charity. So uh, the reason why the the reason why these are called a donor advised fund, you have given the money to a to a entity to hold that money for charitable purposes. You don't own the money anymore, which is why you get the tax deduction. So what you do, sort of like a QCD in a sense. You call it, in our case, we get a hold of Schwab and say, we want to give money from our donor advised fund to these charities. They will validate that it's a real charity. They don't do a judgmental thing on, well, we don't, we don't agree with who you're going to give it to. If it's a valid 501c3, which means it's a nonprofit registered with the IRS, they're going to say, yes, go ahead and do it. The easiest thing is if you give them what's called the EIN number, the employee identification number, that is the tag that makes it very easy for them to, to check on it. 
they then will pay the money out. So you are advising them that you want to pay this money out. They can say, no, we're sorry, the uh, independent political party is not a charity. We can't write a check to them. We can't write it to Billy Bob's bar to pay off your bar tab. Um, no, none of those things can be done. In the case of, it, in a sense, people look at a, a donor advice fund as a poor person's foundation. Um, some people like having a foundation. They can set up a board of directors and they can tell people they have a foundation. They can take some expenses out to go look at charities and things like that. A donor advice fund is much less expensive. There is no, virtually no legal requirement. I, mean, I didn't have to go to a lawyer to set this up. I called Schwab and said, hey, I want to set up an account. Okay, set it up, give us the money. That's sure. all that has to be done with it. And you tell them, this is where I want the money to go. So, By the so. way, uh, uh, Don, myself, David Moore, uh, the, the variety of different charitable sponsors are have a lot of experience with uh, giving to charity. And all of us will help you out at no charge, no obligation, because this is a gift. It has to come from you. And nobody should talk you into it. <laughs> it right. has to fit what you're trying to do. And so, let, so somewhat to that, Pete, let me stop you for a minute because we're going to hit that one in about three slides. Um, one of the things to think about in this is how, how, how am I going to get my hands around this thing? Yeah. Um, plan what are your current financial needs? You know, if you're taking get your money, go through that. Whatever your estate plan is, something like that. You need to have an idea what you want done today and in the future. Strongly consider that if you're having to take out a required minimum distribution, consider using a QCD if you want to give to charity and if you don't need all the money to live on. And if you do, that's the best use of it, live on it. But if you want to give to charity and you have an RMD, please get hold of your broker and say, I want to do a QCD. Don't wait until December 20th. I suggest you do it perhaps in November, just so it all gets done in time and gets out from behind it. All of this pieces into a state plan and where do you want to go and what do you want to do for your beneficiaries or charities, if you wish, or both, because you can set up these things as testamentary or however you want to handle them. I would urge, and it's not a, you don't have to do any of this, discuss it with your beneficiaries as to why you're doing it. Um, you don't have to, as, as Pete likes to point out, the class is called It's Your Money or It's Your Estate. It isn't you and your children. It's yours. So you don't have to have any of these discussions, but I think it makes it easier in the long run for them to understand. Then what options are best for you in terms of what happens, where you want to have this go? I, as Pete had mentioned earlier, highly recommend telling the charity what you want. Um, the trust that we talked about before when we did the distribution, unfortunately, Pete didn't remember at the time to change this because there was a national charity that got $540,000. And we had to mail it to Virginia. I mean, she's a lovely woman, but that isn't who got it. We had to move it, move it to the national headquarters that was located in the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia. I forget which that is. And they are really happy getting the money. They have no idea why they got it. They have no idea the fact that this is coming from California. There was no restriction of what they could do with the money. But if we had said, no, said, give it to the local office um, or use it for these purposes, they will do that. My sister is an example, two charities. I said to her, I want to know specifically what restrictions you want made on the funds that are given. And they had fascinated things that she and her husband, who's now deceased, wanted done with the money. Perfect. Let me know. We'll make sure that we handle that and get that covered. Um, use charitable giving as a part of a legacy. If that, if that works for you and where you're going, there's a wide range of very simple things. QCD is simple to do. Charitable gift annuity, simple to do. Charitable remainder trust, more complicated. Donor advised, very easy to do. So there's a range of the kinds of things you can consider. That's how you can reach me. Uh, I think it was at the beginning, it's the end, it's in my, in my uh, ask first form. There's how easy way to reach me in terms of going through it. You know, obviously CPA lived through this, all this. I started putting this slide in because David Moore and I taught this one time. He goes, do you remember you have to tell them, we're not telling you what to do. We're giving you advice and suggestions on things to think about. 
So this is what that one's a credit for. Thank you, don't get Pete. So my note is thank you very much, but here's sort of where Pete was coming from. We are very help, very willing and happy to help anybody who wants to say, well, what if I wanna do these? Well, wait, wait a second, before you go on, what, see, remember the gift illustrations that you put together? Is that what you're talking about as far as if they want one, that's what they would receive? So if you give me this kind of information to finish my sentence instead of Pete finishing it, <laughs> if you gave me this kind of information or better yet, these are, if you call and say, or send me an email, I wanna do these things. I'm gonna say, you, give, me, give me ages. Give me the, what is it you're giving away? Give me value. Give me you know, tax rates, those kinds of things. I don't need to know who you want to give it to, although that's nice to know just from helping you. But this is the kind of thing. And what I will do is all of those examples you saw kicking through there in, in crescendo, I'll do those and send them to you. I'll email you that here, here it is. Explanations as to what those things mean. That's very easy for us to do, but we need to know this kind of information for doing it. And that's where happy to do it. Send the note, emails again at the bottom of the page here. Um, and, it, and it's a great way to go through and think about it. We've had, when we do these live, you always get the question, well, you know, what should I do? My mother's 94, she's in poor health. She has three rental units, apartments that she had, this is one example. What should we do? And, and I said, I, um, she in poor health? Yes. Wait until she dies because it's all going to up value and you can decide what you want to do. What? And I said, I, you know, that may be the practical answer to this thing. Or if you want to do more, charitable remainder trust, these kinds of things. I use as an example, my wife and I have a, a friend in Arizona through odd situations of a divorce and whatever else came out of it. X number of years later, she was getting $6 million and had no basis. So she's gonna to have to pay capital gains on virtually $6 million. And her answer is, I'm Sicilian. We don't pay taxes. How do I do this? And knowing her for a number of years, I said, well, you, you live on virtually nothing because you don't want money. So somehow we have to figure out how to get this away. My first question, actually, my first question was children. Don't worry about it. They're getting more money than I am in this. Okay, but I want to, and that's one of the questions, you know, do you need to give it to somebody else or where are you? So in her case, she had made very bad financial decisions in the past. So I said, let's take 2 million of this, put it into a charitable gift annuity with a large charity that she had in mind, and you will get X amount of money for the rest of your life and you can't screw it up. Good idea, Don. And it was more than what she wanted to live on. The other 4 million, we set up into a charitable remainder trust, we'll give her more money over her lifetime. But at the end of it, these are the charities that she would get money for. And she chose the uh, Nature Conservancy to get money because she wanted to make sure that when they got the money, they held it in reserve so that the property was, it happened to be, she and her ex-husband had a ranch that they hoped, underneath it was the largest copper reserve in the state of Arizona. And so this was part of the money she was receiving out of that. And so she wanted the property to make sure it was restored. The other part of it, she wanted to give a major amount of money to a local university medical center because when her grandchild was born, they saved her life. And therefore they should get money. And that's what she, and a couple of other charities she wanted. Out of this, she will pay no tax because she'll pay tax over time on the, on the charitable remainder trust, um, but she will pay no tax immediately, which answered her Sicilian question very easily. Right. So. Happy Don, to go through any of these examples. There's no cost for doing it. Happy to do it. Happy to chat. Don, uh, yes. there's a question to just want to repeat. Explain again how the QCD works. Yep. Yep. So if you're 72 or older, you need to pay out a certain amount each year. Or you could do it at 70 and a half. You could do it at 70 and a half, but you're not... But if I'm you're going to make I, a gift to charity, I would recommend 70 and a half. Okay, that's fine. I, and I, I won't dispute that with Pete. <laughs> uh, and again, you max 100,000 a year. So if you have a really big one, you, can, you can't give away all of it. What you wind up doing is somewhere in your brokerage statement, probably on about the last page, there's a little one-liner that says, this is how much you have to pay on your, your required minimum distribution. 
Don't mess it up because if you don't pay it, you get a 50% penalty. So that amount, in my case, it's roughly $22,000. You get a hold of your broker, Merrill Lynch, Fidelity, Schwab, whoever holds your account, and you say, I want to do a charitable, a qualified charitable distribution, QCD. I want to pay these charities. And you could have one, you could have 10, you could have whatever you want to do. They will write the check in the name of the chair. Tell them who it is, may need an address, EIN number, whatever, to make sure they know who this is. And they'll say, yep, okay, we know who to give it to. They write the check to uh, St. Joe's Hospital, whatever. They then, most people will say, and have them mail it. I personally, I'm conservative, I'd like to get it back. So mail it back to me. I then will put it in an envelope, put a note in that says, this is from Gene and I, and I will mail it to them. I've made a photocopy of it. At the end of the year, you will get a 1099R from your brokerage firm that says, you've taken this much, you've taken out your RMD. You don't have to do all of it. You can do part of it. Um, you can take a check to yourself and the rest of it goes to charity, however you want to handle that. What I did was, I have photocopies of these. I told my tax person, these are the charities we paid. That reduces the RMD. They did send Jean a statement because Jean happened to have paid, Jean's slightly older than me. She had to pay hers in 2019. So she then did get a statement from them that said, we paid these charities, the net amount is this much, but they won't reduce your 1099R. So they're real easy to do. You can fill them out, you know, get that information. And because it never comes in as income, it's completely deductible. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you have standard deduction. It never came in as income to you. For most of us, we take the standard deduction. And yeah. Taking yeah. the standard deduction doesn't give that income tax, charitable income tax deduction, much benefit. And by the right. way, most of the brokerage houses, if you call and ask, how does the QCD work? They'll find someone yeah. who will help you and explain it to yeah. you. Yeah. The, the key is the check needs to be made payable to the charity. Right. How it's mailed, that's up to you. You can have it mailed personally, choice. directly to the charity. Right. Just a chair. A lot of times the charity receives these checks from brokerage houses and it just has an account number on there. It doesn't have your name. Yeah, so, they can't. Right. so if you want to do an anonymous gift, that's the way to do it. But they like to thank you. Uh, at least give you a letter of, of appreciation and you kind of want to know that they got it as well. So uh, one, one thing back to something that Pete just alluded to, there's something because of the CARES Act, you can give $300 each. If you're married at $600, you can give that to charity and take it as a tax deduction this year. It, it's separate from your standard deduction. It's called an above the line deduction but you can give up to $600 as a couple filing jointly um, this year with, and still do normal standard deductions. Yeah, and remember, uh, cash is probably the lousiest way to make a gift, but I would say somewhere between 85 and 95% of people give a check or cash. Yes. So, uh, you know, uh, give a and that suggested uh, and uh, and I would suggest a check so you have a record. Yeah, and, and, you know uh, you may want to give an Apple stock. You may <laughs> want to give a uh, mutual fund share. Uh, Whatever. You know, so yeah. yeah, that's the easiest way. It's the most tax wise way of doing it, and that's kind of where we're where we're going. Uh, you want to be tax wise in making your gifts to charity. Right. It's 1130. We're going to honor the time. I'm going to turn off the recording.